Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Paul Merzlach. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of U.S. Naval Institute Proceedings. I'd like to welcome you to uh, this afternoon's panel, uh, The Future of Shipbuilding, What Can the Nation Afford? Uh, I think that uh, is a, obviously uh, a very uh, timely and topical question, uh, especially in light of uh, Admiral Mullen's uh, recent comments at the, the luncheon uh, when he once again uh, reiterated uh, the very serious nature of the, uh, uh, our country's national debt and how he considers that uh, one of the major issues that we face. So as we look at uh, that in light of um, past fiscal crises and, and, and perhaps future ones, uh, we have to consider what are the future shipbuilding needs of the Navy and uh, how can industry support those needs. Uh, also, I think uh, we need to balance the, uh, strike a balance between fiscal responsibility and maintaining, uh, you know, a knowledgeable uh, workforce uh, and industrial base and infrastructure. And we heard uh, Admirals um, Gortney and Blake this morning uh, talk to those very items as well, this idea of uh, if you start to lose this uh, experienced human capital, uh, this shipbuilding knowledge, this industrial uh, infrastructure, uh, can you get it back? How quickly can you get it back? Uh, not like, uh, obviously, in, the, in decades past, people think of World War II in the, in the days when we used to be able to build ships and aircraft uh, quickly, but uh, now uh, with this very specialized uh, knowledge, uh, it won't be easy to reconstitute, so be careful that you don't lose it. Our moderator today, who will uh, guide our esteemed panel members through the discussion, is uh, Captain Robbie Harris, a 30-year veteran uh, of the Navy, uh, surface warfare officer. Uh, he served in a number of surface combatants uh, and commanded the USS Connolly as well as Destroyer Squadron 32. Uh, his shore assignments including, included long-range planner for the CNO executive panel, executive assistant to the assistant to the chairman, joint chiefs of staff, director of programs, SECNAV, office of legislative affairs, and finally executive director for the CNO's executive panel. He was also a key contributor to the uh, maritime strategy of the 1980s as well as from the sea. Uh, since retiring, Captain Harris has worked for Lockheed Martin, where, is, where he is the Director of Advanced Concepts. He also serves as advisor to the Chief of Naval Operations Strategic Studies Group at the War College, as a member of the Secretary of the Navy's Naval Research Advisory Committee, and Chairman of the Board of Directors of the Baltimore Council on Foreign Affairs. He's also a well-published author with numerous articles in professional journals, such as the Naval War College Review, and certainly in our very own Proceedings Magazine, where he appears in the January issue with his article, uh, The Transformation, again, of the Surface Navy. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll turn it over to you, Robbie. Well, Paul, Paul, I thank you very much. And my, uh, my thanks to you, uh, to General Dubia, uh, Admiral Daly, if Admiral Daly is out there, and to uh, my good friend, Fred Rainbow. And incidentally, if you see Fred today, Today is Fred's birthday, so say happy birthday to Fred Rainbow uh, when, you, when you see him. Uh, I, I am very, very pleased to be asked to, uh, to moderate this, this panel, uh, subject being uh, shipbuilding. You, can, you notice probably from the introduction, that kind introduction that Paul gave me, uh, strategy figures pretty prominently in, in, in what I do and where my interests lie. But I've noticed over the years that you scratch any naval officer and what you really find is somebody really, really interested in shipbuilding, uh, ships and the, the SCM plan. Uh, so I think this, this topic we have today is a uh, extraordinarily good one, and I'm glad that um, we've been asked to do it. Uh, I've said to some others that probably next to world hunger, there is no topic more widely discussed in naval circles at any rate than shipbuilding. And I think we have the right panel here this afternoon to, uh, to help us uh, look at that subject and perhaps come up with some new insights. Now, we're at an interesting juncture in history. You heard it talked about this morning, 
by Admiral Gortney. You heard uh, Admiral Mullen speak to it a few minutes ago. Here, on the one hand, we have the new strategic guidance from the President and from the Secretary of Defense uh, to the Department of Defense, and it emphasizes Asia-Pacific region, and because it emphasizes the Asia-Pacific region, it elevates the importance of the U.S. Navy, Marine Corps, and the Air Force. But on the other hand, again, as you heard uh, Admiral Gortney speak to this morning and now just a few minutes ago, Admiral Mullen, while the importance of the Navy is being emphasized, we have this ugly situation with fiscal constraints. So we have a bit of a conundrum. How, on the one hand, do we, how can we afford to build the Navy that this nation needs, especially at this juncture in time? Now, Given that, the question is, how do we afford to build the Navy we need? I think the topic of affordability rises to the fore. And I have asked the panel this afternoon, among their other remarks, to help us think through how do we increase the affordability of the Navy that we need. Now, very, very briefly, let me uh, introduce our, our panel. And these will be brief introductions because we want to maximize the amount of time for you to ask questions and for them to answer your question. Uh, the first speaker will be Ronald O'Rourke to my right, uh, once removed here. Uh, Ron uh, is at the uh, Congressional Research Service in Washington. Uh, I've said this several times before and I'll say it again because I mean it. Uh, there is probably no more objective naval analyst in Washington than Ron O'Rourke. And Ron will begin this afternoon by giving us an overview of this question of the affordability of Navy shipbuilding. Following Ron will be Vice Admiral Hunt, who is the commander of surface forces uh, for the Pacific Fleet. Uh, he will speak to us from the perspective of a requirements guy. He owns all those service combatants out there, and he has a seat at the table to speak to what we need in the future and how we maintain those, those that we have today. So he will speak, among other things, to the affordability from a requirements guy's perspective. Following Admiral Hunt, there will be Admiral Lewis, who is the PEO of ships. Admiral Lewis is the guy who has responsibility for acquiring. He is the acquisition guy. He's going to speak with us from, from the perspective of the acquisition community about the issue of affordability. And then lastly, where the rubber really meets the road, Mike Petters, who is the president and CEO of HII, which many of us used to know is Newport News Shipbuilding and Dry Dock Company. It falls to Mike, again, where the rubber reaches the road. He's the guy who's got to go out and build them, and he certainly has uh, some understanding of what is necessary to make them affordable. I think we have the right panel. We certainly have the right topic, and I look forward to their comments. Uh, Ron O'Rourke will speak first. Uh, Robbie, thank you for the introduction. I should state at the outset that these views are my own, and not necessarily those of my employer. Uh, in terms of setting the context, in addition to the elements that Robbie mentioned, the strategic shift that may tend to na uh, favor naval forces and also the Air Force and the whole federal budget situation, I think the context for naval shipbuilding uh, could also be described as being characterized by some other elements, including, among other things, the fact that the Navy uh, it has been through a period where some of its shipbuilding programs, not all of them, but some of them have experienced cost growth and that this has complicated the Navy's ability to uh, afford a certain amount of shipbuilding within uh, available resources and that the Navy also is uh, working to uh, bring more stability to its Navy ship pro uh, building programs and get them on more of an even keel. So the Navy is moving through that process into what it hopes, I think, is a more stabilized shipbuilding situation. I'm going to do three things in my presentation right here to address the topic of the affordability of Navy shipbuilding in that context. The first is to talk about some old lessons in Navy shipbuilding. 
The second would be to talk about some new approaches, and the third would be to provide some cautionary notes that I think need to be kept in mind as we move ahead. In terms of old lessons, when you ask people what are some shipbuilding acquisition lessons learned, um, people will mention uh, various things, but if you ask enough of them, there are some that tend to bubble to the top and tend to get mentioned more often than others. Uh, one of those is getting the requirements right up front, uh, including the issue of uh, trying to manage your risk by not trying to do too much in any one new shipbuilding program. Uh, more recently, there's been an emphasis on uh, 70 or 80 percent solutions as opposed to perfect solutions. Uh, a second lesson uh, that people tend to mention quite frequently is imposing cost discipline up front, including a discipline on downstream ONS costs, and that also includes using realistic price estimates. As you begin to move into the uh, uh, mode of contracting for these ships, uh, uh, one of the huge lessons uh, that has emerged over the years, which you're all familiar with, is avoiding design construction concurrency, finishing the design before you start building it, and also resisting requirements or design changes or creep as you move through the program. Uh, uh, also when you get into contracting, uh, uh, you should try to use appropriate contract types and you should try to structure your terms to align incentives with desired outcomes. You'll hear people mention that frequently. And then as you are in the process of shipbuilding, you should properly supervise the construction work, and that's something done bo both by the shipyard uh, and by the uh, government soup ship people. While you're doing all this, two other things that people tend to mention is that you should try as much as possible in your shipbuilding planning to provide stability in your planning uh, for industry so that they can uh, have something firm to work against and plan their uh, 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 their labor, labor and uh, capital plant investments against, and you should also try to have a capable government acquisition workforce through this process uh, as you try to oversee all these efforts. Those are all old lessons in uh, shipbuilding and to a large degree for acquisition generally. Uh, the problem is not identifying them, the problem is making sure that you keep your eye on them and don't forget them uh, in the urgency of some other argument that may come up as you move into a shipbuilding uh, program. Uh, and so, uh, f for me, uh, these are not new lessons, they're old lessons, and the uh, challenge is uh, to keep your eye on the prize, keep your focus on these things uh, while you are hip deep actually trying to execute a shipbuilding program. In terms of uh, newer approaches or other things that we can attempt to do on top of that to help bring down the cost of Navy shipbuilding, uh, 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 there are various options. I'll just mention a few. One is to uh, use modified designs uh, rather than generate completely new ones. The Navy is doing that, for example, with the Flight 3 destroyer. Uh, and using commercial designs uh, where that is possible and where that is applicable or derivatives of commercial designs. So the JHSV uh, uh, might be an example of that. The MLP, which is being built out here in San Diego, is an example of both of these things. It's a modified uh, version of a commercial design, and it's also a 70% solution against uh, uh, what was an earlier requirement for that ship. And as a result, that ship is hugely less expensive than the MLP that was originally scoped out uh, a few years earlier. Uh, other approaches uh, include uh, increasing commonality in parts and in systems uh, among ship classes, and that can have a benefit not only in reducing ship construction costs, but also in reducing downstream crew training and uh, ONS costs throughout the life cycle of the ship. Moving to open architecture, not just for electronics, but physical open architecture in the ships, and not just for LCS, but for other new classes in the future. And using, again, where possible and where applicable, multi-year procurement and block by contracting. So these are uh, newer approaches that are on top of these older lessons, and in some cases the Navy has begun to apply these things, for example, the block by contracting on the LCS program. Now finally, some cautionary notes uh, to keep in mind as we work our way through this process. And the first is to remember that shipbuilding is only about 10 percent of the Department of the Navy's budget, and so you can uh, work to reduce the cost of shipbuilding, uh, and you should, uh, but uh, there are a lot of other places potentially in the Department of the Navy's budget that could also uh, benefit from uh, attention toward cost reducing, and if you make progress there, it might actually make more money available for shipbuilding. So it's important to remember that 
although shipbuilding is central to the Navy and to the Navy's future, uh, it represents only a certain slice of the Department and the Navy budget, and there may be opportunities for reducing costs outside of that that can then uh, redound to the benefit of shipbuilding itself. Uh, secondly, in a related vein, it's important to remember that uh, costs at the shipyard represent only a certain fraction of the total procurement costs at the ship. I think it was Phil Teal, who used to be the head of uh, the Ingalls Yard a few years ago, who pointed out that for the ships being built at his yard, uh, the, sh uh, the costs that he was able to control within his own shipyard uh, 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 um, responsibility, the labor and the materials represented only about 30 or 40 percent of the total cost of the ship. So as we move into uh, 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 new efforts to control the cost of shipbuilding, we should remember that those efforts should extend beyond the shipyard to the elements of ship costs that exist outside the shipyard, and that includes the things that are being delivered to the shipyard uh, as uh, GFE or otherwise for installation on the ship. Uh, a third cautionary note is to remember that if you put too much pressure on procurement cost uh, and you reduce the cost of the ship that you're building simply to get down its initial procurement cost, if you're not careful about how you're doing that, it could have consequences down the road for the ship having a shorter service life or for the ship having a higher ONS cost. I can reduce the cost of a ship by building it out of less expensive materials, but that can come back and bite me in the end by driving up the ship's downstream operation and support costs. In the end, the Navy may not be any better off. In fact, it may be worse off if it makes trades of that kind uh, that are unwise. Uh, a fourth thing to remember, I think, as a cautionary note, has to do with the potential for fixed price contracts to uh, play into this situation. There's a strong emphasis on that now, and there has been for the last couple of years. Um, and they can provide some degree of insulation to the government against the risk of cost growth. Um, but there are also uh, other considerations that you might want to take into account with fixed price contracts. Uh, for example, if you put all of the risk for a fixed price contract on the contractor and the ship does experience growth and the contractor experiences a loss, then in shipbuilding, you are going to have to go back to that contractor again. This is not a situation where we will suddenly turn to a different shipbuilder in the future. In a situation where you have to come back to the same contractors over time, if they suffer losses on fixed price contracts, then one of two things is going to happen the next time you go back to that, that firm. Uh, one is that that firm is going to be potentially in a financially weaker situation and will be less able to generate the funds needed to continue the modernization of its capital plant, things that might make downstream ships less expensive to build if it is able to make those investments, or alternatively, that firm, which has a fiduciary responsibility to its own stockholders, is going to have uh, an incentive to try and recover that loss in downstream contracts and how it prices its future work, in which case, where did the government really save its money? It may simply have deferred that cost overrun into costs that are somehow rolled into a future contract. That's not an argument against fixed price contracting. I don't want you to take it that way. It's not intended that way, but I do think it's important to realize that in a situation where you keep coming back to the same contractor, you need to bear in mind what the consequences are are uh, not only over the shorter run, but over the longer run of contracts that happen to experience cost growth. In a related vein, I think it's important to uh, also make a distinction between avoiding cost overruns and building ships at the lowest cost. Those are not exactly the same two things, and in fact, sometimes, uh, or potentially, they can be in competition with one another. They can be in tension with one another. If I wanted to avoid cost overruns, I could do that very simply by pricing ships at a very high level that the shipyard could easily exist under. The prices might float up to that high level, but there wouldn't be any cost overruns. Now, there is a public policy value in avoiding cost overruns because when they do occur, they can upset budget planning by forcing policymakers to come back and pay more money for something they thought they had fully funded, and that can interrupt their budget planning for the things that are in that current fiscal year budget. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, cost overruns, although they are undesirable, uh, can wind up in a situation where even as they occur uh, and even where they create inconveniences, the end cost that you wind up paying for that ship might be less than that ship would have cost if I had simply priced it at a level to ensure that the cost overruns would never have occurred in the first place. Well, These are both... 
Yep. These are both public policy values, but they are in tension with one another, and we need to make sure that we don't identify one with the other being synonymous. We can work to avoid uh, or reduce the risk of cost overruns, and we can work to bring the cost of ships down as much as possible, but there may be a value in pressurizing a contractor by having that contractor aim for a lower cost, even though that increases the risk of an overrun in the future. Two final points. One is, I think, there is uh, potentially not as much emphasis on reducing the cost of the entire shipbuilding effort as there is on reducing the cost of individual ship classes. There are actions that you can take to reduce the cost of individual ship classes or an, an individual class that may or may not uh, actually wind up reducing the entire cost of the Navy shipbuilding effort. Again, uh, it depends on what your focus is, but those two different targets of what you want to optimize are not one and the same thing. And then finally, just as the Navy in, and DOD generally is uh, focusing on 70 or 80 percent solutions as opposed to perfect solutions in terms of ship capability or weapon capability, uh, the Navy in terms of pursuing affordability in shipbuilding may want to focus more on 70 and 80 percent solutions in terms of schedules for when those ships happen. Uh, in terms of pre uh, preserving stability at the shipyard and preserving uh, an even drumbeat of shipbuilding as opposed to jerking the shipyard around by building ships all of a sudden and then not building them, the, Na the, the Navy in coming years, if it is placing a greater emphasis on affordability, may have to accept instances of where ships are delivered either ahead of need to some degree or behind need to some degree for the sake of preserving an even shipbuilding rate at the yard, which can be critical to uh, reducing shipbuilding costs. So I'll leave it right there. Uh, Ron, thank you very much. Uh, Admiral Hunt. Well, first of all, Ron, I thought that was terrific. A lot of wonderful points that I agree with. I'm going to uh, talk from the perspective of first numbered fleet commander. I was uh, the, the third fleet commander out here in San Diego before I shifted over to my new role, current role. Uh, as the type commander for the surface force and take a look at specifics on where we're going and what's important. And I'll tell you, I break it down really into two areas. One is, is capability and the second is cost. And both of those are incredibly important. On the capability side, and I say this because we have a tendency, I think, back in the Pentagon to migrate either to high end or low end. And I'm going to say there's a couple things that we need to take a look at. First is uh, credible combat capability, high end capability, and this can be a combination of both kinetic and non kinetic. Uh, I would offer that we need to look to the future. You know, what are the game changing capabilities that we can put in there? What's the impact of a game changing capability for the overall cost? As missiles and fire control radar, the packages that we put on the hulls uh, go up in price, are there new innovative ways to lower that cost equation? Uh, in competing with the opposition, and, and I believe that there clearly is. You've got to do a combination of both. Uh, but what does it take to beat the adversary? Uh, and, and again, I think that goes to the energy weapons, uh, whether it's uh, lasers, rail guns, high-powered microwave, those kind of things. Take a look at those as alternatives. We can't take a second position seat to any of the adversaries out there, uh, but we need to know what their right level is, and it doesn't have to be uh, the high-end capability in every single platform that we build. A second area that's very important, uh, you know, as a fleet commander is presence. And so we need to be out there, the cop on the beat, uh, the forward presence, operate forward as, as CNO Greener talks about, uh, to be out there in the right numbers uh, and at the right time. And Admiral Mullen talked a little bit about that uh, during his luncheon speech. In, in every event that's occurred over the last decade or so, we've had forces in place at the right time able to respond with the right capability. You can't do that if you don't have numbers up, and that means affordability, but it also means a focus on energy conservation. So what are the legs that I have? What is the sustainability of a particular platform? Uh, how much self-sufficiency can we generate to be out there? So think about the capabilities that need to go into that area. Uh, a third would be the engagement capability. A little bit different than just being present, but how do we engage with partner nations or how do we engage 
uh, in a position that we can change those countries yet undecided as to what camp they want to come in so that they want to operate with us. Uh, Pacific Partnership, uh, African Partnership, the bilats, the multilat exercises that we do, uh, very important piece. I'll, g I'll give you an example. When I had commander command of an FFG, we had three cruisers in my FFG. As we did operations forward, uh, I found that we were very successfully able to interact with uh, the Western Pacific nations, the navies, uh, and, and generate uh, you know, great engagement. Whenever a cruiser was tapped to do the same thing, the other countries dropped out. They didn't want to be overwhelmed. So if you value contact and the ability to shape and change other countries, bring them into our camp, you need to think about what that capability is too. And it might not be the Battlestar Galactica out there, but something less. And so I throw that out there to say it's not just, uh, you know, build the super ship uh, and use what some folks would say is a lesser included capability. It's the requirement to go and build to, to being able to do all three of those areas that I talked about. Uh, that's an important piece, and you need to think about that. Process cost. Uh, cost is everything as the type commander as we move forward. Uh, and I would approach it from the point that uh, I think if we go back to initial design of any ship uh, platform that we are about to begin on, uh, there is an interaction that needs to occur between industry, between the operators, between the maintainers, uh, between the requirements folks. And if we do that up front in an open and a transparent manner, we come up with a different product than if we do it stovepipe, which I would offer we generally have a tendency to do. So how do we break down those barriers and understand where the tripwires are from producibility that drive us to a higher cost, but maybe doesn't give us a tremendously greater advantage? Is that something that we could adjust if we do it up front? And how about uh, the approach that we take right now, which I, uh, my view of the world, personal view, is that we focus on production cost as opposed to the greatest life cycle cost that we have, which is clearly the expenditure of resources throughout the life of the ship as opposed to the production. So are we putting in uh, active life cycle management discussions up front from the very beginning to make, we have the, make sure we have the right kind of stuff in there? So think about some of the different areas. It's producibility. Uh, production trades, uh, that, that sort of thing. It's operability, and operability includes legs and fuel consumption, the ability to have spares, weapons, uh, the, the degree of reliability that the equipment on board the ship has, self-sufficiency, and I'll go resilience. And when I say resilience, I mean the ability to operate by ourselves uh, in, in perhaps an adversary uh, environment out there where folks are trying to disrupt us. Maybe reach back gets a little bit uh, more difficult. Uh, maintainability, uh, the ease of maintenance, ease of repair, so that we can keep that resilience, that sustainability going. And then put the people piece in there for the manning and the training piece, the type of sailor. Is it a career sailor or is it a first term sailor? Yeah, we heard uh, over the, the course of the day, that's a huge, huge cost. And so you need to figure that out as part of the equation and understand art of the possible. Can you spend more money up front on ship design that lowers the, the amount of training that a sailor would have to have to be able to operate that gear. That's, that's important. Uh, and, and so think about that. Uh, make, make sure we get the people piece in there. But it's length of training, unique training, those kind of things. A couple other considerations, and then I'll pause, and hopefully this will generate some questions, is I think we ought to take a look at the ability to split the hull form from the package, the combat systems uh, that goes on it. And if you do that, does that open up opportunity in the future? So maybe you build the hull with a little bit of excess, use commercial practices, many of the things that, uh, that, that Ron talked about that I think are very valuable, with an understanding that over the life of a given ship, uh, we generally end up completely replacing combat systems, doing hm and &E upgrades, uh, those kind of things. So can you do it so it makes more sense? Modularity uh, speaks to a lot of that. And perhaps we ought to take a look as another excursion to that is what should the expected service life of a ship be? So should it be 40 years, 30 years, or 15 years? Maybe it's easier or makes more sense to build a, a short duration ship and replace that, perhaps for some of the smaller craft, than it does to build that hull and try to get 30, 35, 40, 45 years out of it. Again, I'd, I'd ask you to take a look at all those things. That's the kind of discussion that we need to have between those in uniform, between industry, 
uh, and I think our policymakers as we go forward. And if we do that, I think we can drive our costs not only in procurement but the operational budget that we have through the life of the ship uh, down significantly and, and make uh, all this much more affordable. Thank you. Admiral Hunt, thank you very much. Uh, Admiral Lewis. Normally when I'm having a ship affordability discussion, the opening scene of the movie Grumpy Old Men comes to mind. Uh, you got Jack Lemmon and Walter Matthau up on the announcer's booth in a triple-A state baseball stadium. You hear the crack of the bat. Jack Lemmon goes, and the crowd roars. And Walter Matthau says, crowd, what crowd? We could all leave in the same car. So I uh, uh, thank you all for coming here and showing this much interest. I actually don't know that I've ever seen this many people talk about uh, ship affordability. Um, Thank you. You gave three quarters of what I wanted to say, so uh, I'll just cut to the chase. Uh, first, I want to talk a little bit about what we're doing today, and I'll focus on the successes that we've had to do all the things that uh, Ron talked about. And then I want to touch, uh, expand on what Admiral Hunt said about uh, some possible future options in terms of changing ship designs in order to enhance affordability. Um, first thing I look at is what are measures of poor affordability? Uh, the first one I see is force structure. If budgets are flat and force structure is going down, we have an affordability problem. Uh, in the last 10 years, uh, surface, or excuse me, Navy's ship force structure has gone down 10% in a flat, fairly flat shipbuilding environment. And op tempo is up 15%. So there's clearly high demand for the ships, but we're losing ships. That tells me we have an affordability problem. Uh, second thing I look at, uh, more industry specific, is shipbuilding inflation rates compared to OSD and commercial inflation rates. Uh, some folks might want to say, well, ships have gotten more complicated and that stuff, and that's why I compare it to OSD inflation rates, because jet fighters and tanks and uh, missiles and satellites have also gotten more complicated IT systems. So that tends, in my mind, tends to uh, uh, neutralize the military effects and, and looks more strictly at the cost. And for the last several years, shipbuilding inflation, Navy shipbuilding inflation, has been running double uh, OSD inflation. Now, what does that mean? Uh, last year, shipbuilding inflation was running about 2.2 percent a year. What that means is ship prices double every 20 years. So our $2 billion ship this year is a $4 billion ship in 20 years an $8 billion ship in 40 years. So maybe we can afford the $2 billion ship, but at what point can we no longer afford to buy the ships? And if you look back in history, a lot of navies had this problem and they couldn't figure it out. And they stopped being navies. Um, last thing I uh, mentioned earlier was contract overruns. That's an indicator. They're not always bad, uh, but a high degree of contract overruns indicates that there's an issue in the risk management, our risk management processes. So, so what have we done? Uh, first thing I think uh, most important is we've stabilized our budgets. Uh, we've been transparent in our programs. We've told every, what we're gonna, everybody what we're going to do, and then we've done it. Uh, this last year, the Navy awarded contracts and options for 36 ships. Uh, I think that's unprecedented. Uh, worth an aggregate $18 billion. Now, some of those options don't, uh, aren't going to be exercised for a couple of years, a few years into the fit-up, but the point is we basically cleared the roster of all backlog ship orders this year. I only have one ship within my PO that uh, was budgeted before fiscal year 12 that we haven't awarded yet. Uh, in the next year, we've got about 12 more ships to go. So, so we had a big slug of, uh, of ships, 20 of those were the LCSs, um, several other ships. We have all the Sumwalt ships are under uh, contract now. Um, so this gives the shipbuilding community a high degree of certainty of what the work is that with the Navy's got. They've got it under contract or they, or they know those options are coming. And, and I think that's important from the industry perspective, allows them to plan and schedule, do their workforce and, and do other things. Um, last thing is transparent long-term plans. We publish a 30-year plan, we publish a 10-year plan, uh, and that's uh, and we generally stick to it. And we have stuck to it over the last three or four years, and I think that's superb. Also, we have very few first-of-class ship, first ships coming. Over the next uh, several years, it's really only LSDX and TAOX. Uh, and then, as you mentioned, uh, a Flight 3, a modification of the, uh, the DDG-51 line. 
Uh, so we're through a period of uh, a high degree of churn in new designs, and we're entering into a period of, of stable production with existing programs, Virginia class program, the Ford uh, carriers, uh, the DDG restart, LCS, all of those have entered a, uh, a fairly steady long-term production phase, and I think that will give both the Navy and industry an opportunity uh, to uh, really work on affordability. Um, next thing is optimized production schedules. Um, not an area that gets a lot of interest. Uh, Navy actually uh, tasked uh, a group called the uh, NSRP, National Shipbuilding Research Program, to go look at cost and shipbuilding and found that the industry, that, that cost for shipbuilding that occurs late in the process, very much higher than costs for shipbuilding early in the process. It's called the 138 rule. Generally, NSRP validated that rule. NSRP, by the way, is a group of shipbuilders. All the U.S. shipbuilders, uh, first and second, and in many cases, third tier yards get together. Navy works with them to, uh, to look at producibility and cost reduction initiatives. And this was an overarching study. Um, what they found was that about, if a ship is launched at about 80% complete or more, that, will, that indicates a ship that will uh, probably uh, cost within uh, the Navy's budgets and, uh, and cost estimates. For yards that cannot make the 80% mark, that ends up being a, a cost risk area. And the, and the closer they can get to 100%, the better. Uh, so what we are doing with industry is working with them to move that work to the left, to schedule it and execute it earlier in the process uh, of building a ship. This is very disruptive to shipbuilders uh, that haven't done that in the past. Uh, just think about it for a minute if you're building, uh, it's called fabrication, when you're putting a decks together on foundations, you've uh, optimized your shipyard to do that and maybe they weigh 40 tons or 50 tons. If you pull a lot of work to the left, which reduces the cost, now suddenly that module is 100 tons, 150 tons, or 200 tons, or 300 tons. Your facilities may not be able to handle uh, blocks that large, your cranes, your transporter system, the, literally the floors and the buildings may not be able to take that level of weight. Um, it's a very disruptive to the shipbuilders. So one area we're looking at working with shipbuilder on afford shipbuilders on affordability is looking at those, major, those cost drivers at the shipbuilding level and working with them to optimize their processes and reduce cost. Uh, during the LCS award, that's what you're seeing out of uh, the two companies that won those contracts, Austell and Marinette. Uh, Austell has uh, invested $200 million in new facilities and expanding their production facilities. Uh, Marinette is, uh, is expending about $75 million on their facilities. Uh, another thing, uh, another area for shipbuilders is something called a spaghetti diagram. What's the flow of work through the yard? What you want is spaghetti that's in the box what frequently happens is spaghetti that's on the plate. Uh, and you can imagine that spaghetti on the plate isn't very efficient. Um, I first encountered this on a C-17 program. They had a metric called time on wing. Uh, they were having cost problems early in the program, couldn't deliver an airplane at cost. They were late, they were over cost, they had a lot of QA issues. They started actually tracking their individual workers. What they found was they were spending less than 50% of their time on the airplane. They were off looking for parts, they were off looking for tools, they were off looking for an engineer, they were off looking for an inspector. And uh, I think it was McDonnell Douglas at the time, now Boeing, took a look at that and started moving things around. They restructured the production process, very fundamental work, blocking and tackling, if you will. They got time on wing up above 80%. And the worker went on the airplane at 6 a.m. in the morning, 7 a.m. in the morning, and he, he or she stayed there all day long. They needed a tool, it was right there. They needed a part, it was right there. They needed an engineer, it was right there. And that's the kind of uh, work that we're focusing on both within the Navy and the shipbuilders to look at the fundamentals of shipbuilding and what is it that we can do with them and what should they be doing uh, within their business to fundamentally reduce the cost of the ships. Uh, the last area I want to talk about uh, was something Admiral Hunt touched on, which was changing how we design and build our ships. Uh, our current process was essentially invented uh, during Queen Elizabeth's reign. Her asymmetric advantage over Philip II of Spain was that her warships were built to be warships, not merchant ships that carried guns. They were faster, they were more powerful. And that started our current ship design process. She learned her captains tightly integrated ship and weapon. That's the way we design ships. 
what's happened in the 20th century with aircraft carriers and amphibious ships, I call it cross-domain ships, ship to airplane, ship to marine. It turned out that, uh, that the airplanes were changing faster than the ship designers could design ships. They couldn't do it in the regular way. So they had to separate the ship and the mission package. And so you see an aircraft air carry design in the 1930s and 1940s, that very painful process of undoing 300 years of learning in ship design to separate the airplane from the ship so that the airplanes could change. Those airplanes then were modernizing or being changed out every two or three years. And the ship was designed to be able to take that and sustain that level of change. Uh, I'm grateful to Norman, Norman Friedman for pointing it out to me several years ago. So you get ships today, aircraft carriers like the Midway, served for 47 years. It was combat relevant on its first uh, deployment and it was combat relevant on its last deployment, 47 years later. That's unprecedented in surface shipbuilding. And that was because the ship and the airplane were separate. And we could modernize the airplanes and as long as the ship could carry it, Midway really only had one major midlife modernization, it could do it. Uh, recently we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the Enterprise, same thing. Mission relevant first deployment, mission relevant last deployment and the air wing changed completely in that process. Uh, today I see LCS as a toe in the water for the service community to do exactly that. The ship and the mission of the ship, the mission package are separated. You can change out a mission package easily. You don't have to take the ship to the shipyard for six, year, six months. You don't have to spend $200 million changing it out. You take it in, two weeks later it comes out and it's got a new mission. And I think we in the service Navy need to learn how to do that on LCS, on MLP, uh, and on JHSV. How do we do this new thing? Because it's not cross-domain. We're not driven to it. We're going to it because we want to do it. And we need some time to figure that out. And then future surface ships, if they're built that way, very significant uh, change in how we would build the ships, how we would equip the ships, and a significant impact, and I think a positive impact, on the cost of those ships by separating out that mission package, uh, both for new construction and as well, Ed Mahan mentioned, in service. You don't, you're not, we're not tied to the, uh, to the uh, integration that we have currently in our ships. If you want to change your radio out, you change it out. You don't have to go in there, cut bulkheads, cut foundations, rip out ventilation, figure out how to get through a hatch. All that stuff tends to go away in that environment. Thank you. I'm Lewis, thank you very much. Uh, Mike Petters. Thanks, Robbie. Um, I uh, appreciate the chance to be here today, and I thought uh, I'd do a couple of things and then kind of let it go back to uh, questions and answers here. Um, first of all, about Huntington Ingalls Industries. Uh, we used to be called uh, Northrop Grumman Shipbuilding, and a uh, long time before that, we were Newport News Shipbuilding and Ingalls Shipbuilding, which was, you know, 10 years ago was part of Lytton. So I don't really need to, in this audience, necessarily reintroduce everybody to Newport News Shipbuilding and Ingalls Shipbuilding. But Huntington Ingalls, uh, we, we uh, are as a corporation spun off from North Grumman on the 31st of March last year, so we're almost 10 months old as a publicly traded company. We, we, uh, we have a ticker symbol on the New York Stock Exchange. We have all of the, the, the challenges and the requirements of that, that come along with that. Uh, but we still have uh, inside of our business the long-standing heritage that goes back decades and at Newport News goes back as far as 125 years of the, the tradition of quality and excellence that comes with building ships for the United States Navy. The, um, the, the, in fact, one of the very first things that we did was we restored the names uh, you know, of the shipyards. The, uh, under Northrop Grumman, we were Northrop Grumman Shipbuilding. Uh, with sites in Newport News and Pascagoula and New Orleans, and we restored all the names back to Newport News Shipbuilding and, and uh, Ingalls Shipbuilding. We do have a site in Avondale, and I'll talk a little bit more about what's happening there because that may actually be kind of relevant to, to this panel. Um, we are involved in building aircraft carriers, submarines, destroyers, and amphibs. Uh, and I would suggest to you, if you put those on a piece of paper and kind of went from first to last, you would have a list of the Navy's platforms that are at the very top of the shipbuilding order of battle, aircraft carriers and submarines and destroyers and amphibs. Uh, I like to tell folks that that is a, 
measure of uh, priority and complexity in terms of platforms. Uh, you know, the, uh, I've had a chance to personally be involved in the construction of all of those ships, uh, and they are, they are incredible platforms. And I would suggest to any of you that if any American sailor has ever been sailing on one of those ships and pulled into a foreign port, I dare say that he never thought once about wishing he was on somebody else's ship in that port. He was very happy to be on a, on a U.S. ship of, the, of that caliber. Um, in those platforms, we are the, the sole source provider of aircraft carriers. The, uh, we are on the sole source team for submarines. Uh, we're about half of the program for destroyers. And we're the sole source provider for large deck amphibs and the LPDs, the medium-sized amphibs. So we have a pretty good sense of what the, the top end of the Navy's order of battle is really all about. And, um, and I would say that you know a lot of folks want to talk about force structure and, and things like that. I like to hear discussion about equities. Uh, because I think that one thing that the Navy has done a really good job with here, and they're not giving themselves enough credit for, is that they understand that there's a, there is not only the nation's ability to produce an aircraft carrier is important, but they understand the equity, the investment required that backs up the fact that that ship goes to sea. And they've done a really good job, I think, in the past two or three years of explaining the connection between um, the, the nation's ability to produce that platform and what that platform can do when it's out there performing missions in the national interest. I, I don't think that they necessarily give themselves enough credit for that. And I think that uh, in my almost 30 years now of in this, in this business and industry, uh, I think that there's a better understanding of that out there today than, than I've ever seen. Um, we also do a, a platform for the Coast Guard, which is National Security Cutter, which is the centerpiece of their, uh, their recapitalization effort today. Um, and there's some lessons that we can learn from the National Security Cutter as it applies back to naval shipbuilding and, and touch on a couple of things that have already been said here. Uh, a few years ago, I had a chance to address this, pan this group. And I talked to you then about a, uh, a rubric for thinking about shipbuilding. Um, as uh, I think I used the words uh, three-legged stool. There's a, there's a question of what is the requirement. I think we've had some discussion about the requirements today. There's a, a question about what's the funding for that requirement. And I, obviously, that's uh, been talked about already and will probably get talked about some more. And then there's the question of, it, of execution. And those three things, the requirements, the funding, and the execution, all interrelate uh, and play off of one another from the, from the beginning of thinking about how, am I going to do, how are we going to go do that mission as a country to the actual delivery of the product that's going to go do that mission. Uh, not unique to shipbuilding, but certainly uh, uh, a big part of, uh, of what we do uh, out there today. Um, I, I think that we're... Uh, to echo some of what I've heard here, especially from uh, Admiral Lewis, um, we've gone through a decade where, if you go back to those four types of ships, uh, basically every one of those types of ships has gone through a decade of lots of design change and lots of design iterations. Uh, whether it's the Ford, which is a whole new design where we've taken a lot of people off the ship, we did a design for affordability on the, the submarine program, uh, in the destroyers, we've gone down the path of the DDG-1000, but we've also come back and said we're going to go down the path of the 51s. And in the, and in the amphibs, we've, we've come through the, the, question, the whole production issues around the LPDs, but also the LHD and the LHA. LHD-8 represents a step forward in the design uh, of large deck amphibs, and then LHA-6 and then ultimately LHA-7 uh, represent an even newer design in large deck amphibs. And so we've had a decade where there's been a lot of design iteration, a lot of design change, and, and uh, from a pure waterfront production standpoint, a lot of design perturbation. But, uh, but that's, you know, that's what we've had to do as a nation because those are the requirements that we had to go uh, be able to meet. Um, but echoing uh, Admiral Lewis's comments, we have now kind of come through that and we're moving into a decade where the focus is going to be on production. And it's going to be on being able to execute in a predictable fashion to the quality standards that, uh, that we all are, are uh, we expect uh, from our programs. Um, our approach to that is that, uh, and we see this not just us, but we see this in shipyards around the world, 
that the more you can get the program into a serial production run where you're doing the same things over and over and over again, the more likely you are to be able to manage your investments, uh, predict the outcomes, manage the risks, uh, and control the, the, uh, the excursions, if you will, in terms of what the, whether it's an overrun or a, or a share line issue or whatever. Um, serial production becomes a central, central strategy for how you go about doing this. And I told you I was going to talk about the National Security Cutter. I, I think that's a, that, is, that is one case in point where we had a couple of issues around the first two ships uh, in terms of the startup because the design was still in flux. Uh, we needed to kind of get the thing going. We had to figure out, you know, in shipbuilding, the first ship you build is actually, it's a prototype, but it's also the first production unit at the same time. Well, in prototypes, if you're building a prototype in any other, in any other uh, industry, the prototype is where you prove out the design, you prove out the production processes, you prove out the technology of the platform, you also prove out the supply chain, you prove out the capital that you've invested for, you're proving all of that stuff. And so whenever you have a hiccup on that, it creates lots of churn in the system. And so the startup of a program is always pretty dynamic. Um, but in the, in the case of the National Security Cutter and with the Coast Guard, we were able to pin down the design on, on NSC3 and say, this is the way we're going to build this ship going forward. And, uh, and now we've got contracts for four and five, and the Coast Guard is uh, uh, very satisfied with the way that we can predict the, the cost and schedule performance on those programs. And I would say it's not, it's not a new item. We knew how to do this. We did this on destroyers back in the late 80s and the early 90s. They were, they, were the, they were the Virginia program before the Virginia program came along. And of course, the Virginia program today is the gold standard for uh, shipbuilding production. So with that as a preamble, I look forward to any questions that you all might have. Thank you. Mark, thank you very much. Well, I must say what a um, very pleasant surprise this is. Uh, last week, when after the Naval Institute and FC uh, publicized the fact that I was going to sit in for or stand in for Dove Zykam, the chair of this panel, I got a couple of phone calls. And one fellow who knows an awful, awful lot about shipbuilding called me and said, Robbie, you need to know that Navy shipbuilding is broke. And there are only three things that can be done. Number one, they can build different stuff. They can build it differently, or they can build less. That was pretty sobering. The week before, I was up at the Naval War College in an uh, effort focused on redoing or refreshing the current strategy or the cooperative strategy for 21st century sea power. And they had a guy from the Royal Navy there who said, Listen, you have to understand that members of parliament and members of the cabinet all say the right things about the Royal Navy. Royal Navy is very, very important. Uh, globalization, trade, global, you, your Royal Navy, incredibly important. However, comma, when they come to us with a price tag that is this high for a ship, there's not much we can do to help them. So that was sort of my backdrop in coming into this panel today. And what I've heard from these four panel members who are not, uh, who are not you know, paint a smiley face on it kind of guys, not a single one of them, has been very, very positive uh, from each one of them. And I think the points that I would make, and I would ask you to comment on and ask the panel to comment on, is number one, it seems that the Navy is in a, has begun and is in a period of stability in ship design. They're not going to build new stuff. They're going to build stuff that's proven, and if anything, they will modernize to, to some degree and, and as necessary. And as Admiral Lewis pointed out, there are 36 ships, either under contract or options for 36 ships. That's incredibly important, I think. And then I'll go back to the stability question. Few new designs. So this has been a, a very positive, uh, eye-opening panel for me. So with that, for, let me first ask the panel members if they would like to comment on the others' comments, and then we'll open it up to the audience. The panel? OK. Yes, sir, you have the first question. Uh, Lance, <coughs> Lance Leventhal at the ATCA newsletter. 
I'm sorry to be negative about this, but I think you gentlemen are totally unrealistic. If we have sequestration, as we're very likely to have, if perhaps this year, as I think Admiral Mullen said it's possible, uh, perhaps next year, perhaps Ron Paul is our next president. Uh, we're going to go down to half the number of ships we have, no new construction whatsoever. In the event that something like that happens, I can suggest three proposals, which I think are as realistic as what you're talking about. Number one is the Renta Center. You know that wrestler who says, free until February the 4th? We check to see if he has any battleships or any carriers. Number two, we go to cloud warfare. We don't have any Navy whatsoever. We get one from Google or Amazon.com when we need it, return it when, they are, when we're finished with it. Or three, we resume the SALT talks. We limit warfare to only being cyber warfare or PlayStation, which is about the only things we're going to be able to afford. So given those scenarios, what can we salvage out of this situation? It's a real issue far, before, far beyond just getting ships to be made more efficiently. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, who would like to ta tackle that one first? Ron? Uh, just to uh, put the questioner's comments into perspective, uh, his point about uh, what I refer to as stage two of the budget reduction process is well taken. Even if the law is changed uh, to lift or uh, amend the current law that calls for the sequestration to be put into effect next year, there might still be some other form of budget reduction to take its place. But let's say, uh, for the sake of argument, that the sequestration does occur. That's a $1.2 billion, trillion dollar effort across the federal government. Defense is to have half of that. You get a credit for avoided payments on uh, interest on the federal debt, and so instead of a, the defense hit being 600, it turns out to be 500 or 550 billion. Over 10 years, that's a $55 billion per year reduction to the defense budget, uh, most of which comes uh, in the first two years of that 10-year period. And so you're talking about $55 billion sudden reduction to the defense budget. If you were to not increase the Department of the Navy's share of the DOD budget, and if you were to leave shipbuilding as the same percentage of the DON top line, you would basically be losing two ships per year out of the 10 or 11 that you're building. So you're not going to be in a situation of uh, shipbuilding being completely wiped out. Uh, you will instead be in a situation where roughly two ships out of 10 will disappear. That assumes a certain amount of flexibility in how the sequestration is applied, and due to a little remembered 1990 amendment to the sequestration law, there is in fact an ability on the part of the executive branch to reallocate the defense budget prior to applying the sequestration to get rid of some of the worst effects that would happen in a completely mindless mathematical application of sequestration. So it is not the case that shipbuilding is going to disappear completely. Uh, even under a scenario where the Navy is not treated favorably, any more favorably than any other part of DOD, and shipbuilding is not treated any more favorably than any other part of the DON budget. But it would have an effect. In my view, uh, that simply makes more um, uh, critical uh, the efforts that uh, I think the panel has discussed here to do everything you can to reduce and maintain control of the cost of the ships that you do build. Ladies and gentlemen, if you ever want to get level set on reality, call Ron O'Rourke. Uh, would another panel member like to comment? Sir, you have the next question. Yes, these, these are, this, I actually have two questions for Admiral Lewis and one short comment for, for Mr. Petters. Um, Admiral, this, these are sort of backward-looking questions that I've got relative to a couple of comments that you made, sir. Um, I'm an old destroyer driver, and I can remember back in the Vietnam days when we thought about, if you didn't know what an inflation rate was going to be, you used 3 or 4 percent, often 4 percent. Now, when you said 2.2 percent, that sounded pretty good from my historical perspective, unless you mean that's 2.2% above what is the 
otherwise national average. Is that what you meant? No, it was uh, this last year it was 2.2 for shipbuilding absolute. Can you turn his microphone on, please? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, no, it's 2.2 percent absolute shipbuilding inflation rate. That was last year. It's up this year. Uh, the DOD rate at the time was about, I think it was one, or excuse me, 0.8. Uh, general inflation is lower than that. Well, I have to say then that based on some historical, at least from my point of view, that seems pretty good. Oh, Congratulations. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the second question, uh, back in, in that day, DE 1052 ships arrived in Vietnam sometimes incomplete. I can remember one case in particular, the ship arrived and, and the, uh, uh, the, the flight deck uh, equipment was just not complete at all. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the only case that I remember, but I remember that there were quite a few of them. Is this what you meant when you spoke about ships coming out 80% complete? Actually, I was no. Um, that that's 80% at launch. I'm sorry, I should have been more oh, okay. precise. So, uh, when they're complete, they're complete, 100% complete. They've been through acceptance trials. They've been inspected actually twice by INSOR. Uh, very uh, intensive process. But so 80% was complete. 80 to 100% complete at launch when they go in the water is a is a metric for uh, a a good shipbuilding program, if you will. Thank you. Uh, and so that's what I was referring to. And and, and Mr. Fetters, I, I've been aboard the Weishi and I've took a, taken a ride on it. It's a wonderful ship, and I wish I had had an engineering plant like that one when I was driving. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you, Colonel. Gentlemen, this is a question for the whole panel. Uh, we get a couple of which seem to be uh, competing uh, requirements uh, as you discuss them. Uh, one is uh, Admiral Hunt's point of uh, numbers of hulls being uh, important to forward presence to uh, what is sometimes termed as influence squadrons. Uh, and another is to the overall capability of a fleet or a set of numbered fleets at large. Uh, as we look at the cooperative strategy of the 21st century, uh, we hear a lot of numbers of hulls that are going to be required to execute this, plus a lot of pontification about the high-low mix. We hear anything from 313 to 287 to 245 to 11 CVNs to 9 CVNs. Is there essentially a, a, a stick in the ground at the zero, zero point that we're actually beginning to talk about this in real numbers from? Admiral Hunt. Uh, I, don't, I don't think at this point there is. Is this on? Yeah. Uh, we, you know, we are still sticking with 313 at this point, but we're taking a look at everything. As you take a look at the, uh, the refocus that we have in the strategy that's come out here about two weeks ago uh, that focuses Middle East and, and uh, you know, the, the Western Pacific, if you will, uh, I think there will be a continued analysis and we'll figure out what that takes. Uh, but I think there's lots of options out there to have the presence uh, that is required to, to have the influence. and and uh, to manage those numbers up and down. Right now, uh, 313 remains in, until someone else comes out with another number, CNO in particular. Mike. Yeah, if I could just uh, add to that. Um, you know, from the industry standpoint, uh, I might have an opinion about what the number is, but my opinion doesn't count. And, and uh, you know, more is better. But what I would say that the part that, that I think is, is worth knowing here is that if we find ourselves in a place where we're going to take the structure to some other number, particularly a number that's going down, um, the, the preferred way to do that from the industry standpoint in terms of preserving the equities of the industry and preserving the capabilities is to take old ships out of service early and continue to build. Uh, I've actually been through a couple of programs where we've where we've actually stopped building the program only to try to restart it 10 years later and submarine program at Newport News is a, is a classic example. We had a whole bunch of really smart guys sit down and map out how we were gonna get from the last submarine to the first submarine, how we were gonna manage the talent, how we were gonna manage the investment, how all those plans were gonna come together. We executed that plan with, uh, with great precision and we missed it by a factor of two. And so the, the possibility of stopping and restarting, uh, as opposed to taking ships that may not be 30 years old, take them out of service early and keep the, keep the equity going in terms of how you, you build the ships, I think is a very important point when we start thinking about this. And, uh, it, at the risk of being clubbed by the guy behind me, this leads to a, a, another question. 
when we take them out of service when they're, you know, half or two-thirds of the service life, are we looking at mothballing and preserving or are we looking at scrapping? Because uh, industry is industry's one thing, but these are very large capital investments of the coin of the realm here uh, in still very much combat-capable platforms. And if hulls in an emergency are what are required, now I look at uh, NRF in Philadelphia and it's pretty much empty. Uh, if we can't surge because we don't have the capacity at that point, are we looking if we retire early to mothball or are we going to dispose? Uh, Ron O'Rourke. Uh, I think in the context of Mike Petters' remarks, he was talking about a scenario where you take them out of service, they are out of service permanently. But to broaden the context for your question just a little bit, uh, as was mentioned a minute ago, the Navy's current number is 313, and that's not a one-dimensional number. It's a number that takes unit capability into account. It takes into account how you get synergies when ships operate together in a networked environment. It takes into account where the ships are based and their operational cycles and so on. So it's actually a multi-dimensional number. And it's also the case that the Navy's not only currently below this number, but if you were to actually build every ship in the Navy's 30-year shipbuilding plan, you would not achieve and maintain all elements of that 313 ship plan over the long run. Uh, there are some major unfunded requirements in that 30-year or underfunded requirements in that 30-year shipbuilding plan. There are more than 20 destroyers short of their requirement. There are several attack submarines short of their requirement and a few amphibious ships. There's a total of well over 30 ships you would add back into the 30-year shipbuilding plan to come up with a plan that if you were to then build it, you would actually achieve and maintain all elements of the 313 ship plan over the long run. And if you were to price out those 30 plus extra ships that you would put in, it's well over $50 billion of additional shipbuilding funding. And so uh, I think that's also worth adding to the earlier description of the context of the shipbuilding affordability challenge. The Navy is starting this game from behind the eight ball. Now, one way of substantially mitigating, at least over the, um, uh, uh, the midterm, the uh, largest segment of that shipbuilding shortfall, which is in destroyers, is to not take the ships out of service, but instead to extend their service lives. I can mitigate the uh, 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 destroyer shortfall almost completely by putting 20-something extra destroyers into the shipbuilding plan, but the nation may not be able to afford that. If I instead extend the service lives of the 28 oldest destroyers, the Flight 1-2 destroyers, that 20-plus additional ships becomes 13, of which two are sooner and 11 are further downstream. And if I extend the lives of those Flight 1-2 destroyers by 10 years to 45 years, those 20 extra destroyers become two. So the Navy, I think, is in a situation where they need to examine the technical feasibility, and I don't even know if it's feasible to extend the Flight 1-2 destroyers five years to age 40 or 10 years to age 45, because the Navy has a challenge even getting them to uh, 35 years at this point. Uh, so the Navy needs to examine the feasibility uh, of that, but if it is feasible, it could have uh, a lot of leverage in terms of making it easier to get to uh, uh, the number uh, that right now is the largest unfunded requirement in the 30-year shipbuilding plan. And if you are to extend the service lives of those ships or to think about it, that means treating those ships differently now. Because if you think of those ships as being 40 or 45 year ships instead of 35 year ships, we probably need to start thinking about treating them better now. Uh, and so it's, that's a decision that even though it's intended to solve a downstream issue, is something that can drive near term decision making and near term uh, requirements in terms of uh, funding for improved maintenance. Uh, Mike Petters. Yeah, just uh, on your question about uh, mothballing, I think that one thing you have to step back is that there's no single answer to that question. The, the more complex the ship is, the less likely you are to be able to efficiently mothball it, I think. Uh, nuclear ships are not going to be mothballed. That's just not going to happen. Um, and I think that the one thing that I would just add, I think Ron's analysis is very, very insightful about extending the life of ships, and I 100 percent agree with if you're going to turn a destroyer into a 45-year ship, you need to treat it differently today. Um, as was mentioned, we just came through the 50th anniversary of the Enterprise. The interesting thing about a platform that's 50 years old is that it's, it's very, very difficult to predict the maintenance cost. 
maintenance, maintenance, maintenance you would think would be kind of steady, but just like in your car, you know, I've, I have vehicles that are older than 10 years and I dread taking them to the shop now. You know, I used to not mind the 20 bucks to get an oil change, but now I don't get off for $20 anymore. And that's the same thing for, for, uh, for ships. So I think that that's got to be factored in to the way you think about extending life. So. Thank you very much. Uh, Sam Tangretti. Yes, I, I was, when I heard Mike Petter say that every ship is a prototype as well as a production unit, it reminded me of uh, something that Wayne Meyer once said, Rear Admiral Wayne Meyer once said, if you put more than three technolo unproven technologies on a ship, it's got to be a problematic program. And I wanted to ask to see if anybody in the panel would like to comment about DDG-1000, or actually DD-1000, it's really not a DDG, whether there were lessons learned in that that drove us more towards the modularity and the approach that seems to be providing stability today. Thank you, Sam. So are you, there are 10 new technologies in DDG-1000, and, uh, and they were mitigated through a very uh, lengthy and, uh, and, and frankly pretty effective uh, uh, EMD, engineering manufacturing development program for each one of the 10. Um, the ship design uh, does um, allow for easier change out of components if something does need to be replaced, electronic components in particular. There's a, a, a containerized, all the electronics for the ship is containerized uh, within uh, units called EMEs, electronic module enclosures. Uh, uh, there's about five different sizes, and I think there's 20 or so throughout the ship. So if, you, if, you, if you're familiar with an Aegis ship, you walk into an equipment room or something, you're seeing all the racks. If you walk in the same space in a DDG-1000, there's two big boxes with a door on them. And, uh, and a cable goes in one end of the big box. And inside the box is all the racks and equipment that you're used to seeing. Uh, so if something needs to come out, it comes out of the box. The box can't come out, but the stuff inside the box can come out. So it's separated from the shipbuilding environment. It's uh, it, those the uh, the boxes are populated at uh, a, at a manufacturer's facility, you know, right there under Lockheed Martin, um, and sealed up, delivered to the shipbuilder uh, with a plug on the outside, or you know, lots of plugs on the outside. They're self-contained for air conditioning and uh, and all that sort of stuff. So. So as we get into activation and test, if there are issues, and then we'll, it's easier to get in there and, uh, and work on them. Also, those boxes are much less subject to contaminate, industrial debris contamination. Uh, if, if you're doing it in a normal way, there's grinders, there's smoke, there's uh, stuff floating around in a combat system space, and that's not at all the case on DG-1000. So, uh, so you're right, uh, having lots of technologies is a risk. Uh, that was recognized early in that program, and uh, we've been managing that uh, very aggressively uh, over the life of the program. Ron, I, I see your hand, but I want to ask Admiral Hunt if he'd like to comment on this question. I think, you know, again, we did know that there was uh, going to be a lot of risk when we had tackled the DDG-1000 program. Uh, so we've gone in and, uh, you know, as, as indicated, we've tried to mitigate that as we've gone along. Uh, there's lessons learned from that. I think they'll be applied to future programs. Uh, it's one of those challenges that you take on and you make a decision up front and then you live with that. Ron O'Rourke. Uh, just a couple of uh, points to help fill out the, the description of that program and its status. Uh, while those ships were being funded, the Navy argued that the design of that ship included features that were intended to improve its producibility and make it less expensive to produce per ton uh, than would normally be the case, that the ship is a little bit uh, larger, a little bit more loose on the inside than the 51 design, includes a greater degree of straight pipe runs instead of crooked pipe runs and so on. And so uh, one thing you can note in addition to the new technologies and the risk and the Navy steps to mitigate those risks through the various EDMs is the fact that the design of the ship includes features that are intended to uh, improve its producibility pound for pound. And the other thing to note is that to date at least, uh, the execution of the construction of that ship is apparently uh, pretty close to uh, its estimated cost. Now, cost overruns on ships 
uh, uh, tend to occur most spectacularly in the latter stages of the construction of the ship, and we are not there yet. Uh, so I, I'm not saying one way or the other what's going to happen as the ship continues to move through the construction process, but at least based on the public reporting of the ship's construction to date, uh, this is a ship that is in the construction process reportedly is executing well. Unfortunately, uh, we have reached our bewitching hour, and I see there's three guys standing up, but unfortunately there's not time, and I'm about to get the hook myself. Thank you, Robbie, and thank you, gentlemen, uh, for your very insightful comments this afternoon. And uh, I think it's uh, particularly appropriate that we uh, closed with a discussion uh, of the DDG-1000. And I'll, I'll take the opportunity uh, to just let everybody know that in the next issue of Proceedings, which will be available just about a week from today, there is an article uh, called uh, Zumwalt versus Burke, The Wrong Debate which uh, I think will be of interest uh, considering what we were just talking about here uh, this afternoon. Uh, I also um, uh, was struck by, uh, as somebody who's sort of a recovering historian uh, from a former life, uh, but uh, Admiral Lewis uh, reaching back and, and giving us uh, historical examples, uh, certainly from you know, the example of uh, Queen Elizabeth's Navy and, uh, and certainly talking about the, uh, the Midway and her air wing changing over time. Uh, and, and I think that, uh, you know, uh, in, in using history as a tool, we can always, uh, you know, sometimes see where we're going by, by seeing and looking at where we've been. Uh, and uh, I'd like to thank our, our panel members, and, and we have uh, for each of them uh, a copy of uh, the book 32 and 44, Building the Portsmouth Submarine Fleet in World War II uh, from the Naval Institute Press. And again, I, I think uh, there, there may be some useful lessons in there as well. So please uh, join me uh, in thanking our panel members again for their participation this afternoon. And I'd also like to remind everybody of the um, reception and uh, softball game this evening at Petco Park at 6.30 with the Wounded Warrior uh, Amputee Softball Team. We hope to see you there. Thank you again. Good afternoon. <laughs>